do some talking. Okay, well, hello and welcome. Uh, we're going to be talking about Monkey today. Um, I want to introduce myself, my compatriot here. My name is Shay Craig. I work for SAS. It's a software company out of North Carolina. We have, uh, I think, a little over 90 offices around the world, about 15,000 employees. Um, and I am the IT systems engineer for them. I handle Max. That's all I do. And it's pretty wonderful. I'm Elliot Jordan, uh, based in Emeryville, California. I'm from the Lindy Group. Uh, we do IT consulting for companies all around the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, big and small. And uh, I also handle a lot of Macs. So here, here I am. Yeah, awesome. So um, our agenda for today, we, we've kind of broken this down into some groupings. We want to just talk a little bit at the beginning about some issues of IT professionalism. Um, I feel like that's a good way to open this up. We're going to spend a decent portion of this talking about documentation, um, that thing that we all like to try and forget about. Uh, and then we're going to spend a lot of time going over design and a little bit of time going over maintenance. And, and I think these uh, maybe are sound kind of designy, uh, don't make a whole lot of sense. They're just they're meant to be kind of evocative of these different sections that we're talking about, but I think it, it'll make sense. So, what we're trying to do today overall is look at a kind of holistic picture of managing Max in our environments, which are, in my case, one company, but quite large, and in Elliot's case, you know, many different companies, but through one provider. Um, and trying to pick out some things that we do that may be useful for different kinds of organizations that maybe are not the same scale. Um, so, the first thing I want to do is just throw this book up here. Um, I like to read a lot of books, and this one I think is super good. It, it, it wouldn't hurt to read this. Um, Robert C. Martin has a lot of great books, and he has another one called Clean Code that is just an awesome book about how to write code that other people can read and isn't hard to maintain, it's easy to comprehend, and is really of high quality. And so he wrote the second book called The Clean Coder, which talks about what it means to be a professional software engineer. And it's kind of a, a creed almost for that profession. And of course, for the most part, we're not necessarily software engineers, although many of us probably would prefer to spend all day coding rather than crawling around on the floor, you know, plugging printers in and stuff. Um, and I think there's enough uh, important information in there that goes both ways that it's, it's definitely worth reading. Um, so one of the things he talks about in this is that, you know, being a professional means that uh, it means a little more than just that you get paid to do what you're doing. That you take responsibility for your work, you know how everything works, you know that they do work. Um, just pulling some stuff out of the book, you know, I don't want to read the whole book to you. Um, I can if we had time, do a dramatic reading, but uh, instead I'll just pull out a couple things. Um, he pulls out this, uh, you know, physicians have this mandate to do no harm. And he applies that to his job as well as a, as a programmer. Um, and he further breaks it down into two kind of sub-ideas, like do no harm to function, do no harm to structure. And he says, we harm the function of our software when we create bugs. Therefore, in order to be professional, we must not create bugs. No problem, right? <laughs> um, and of course, he's trolling people a little bit. And he goes on to say, like, obviously, this isn't possible. But if you're a human being and you don't realize that you are going to make lots and lots of mistakes over the course of your life, then you're not really in touch with reality. Um, that being a professional means not only do you know that you're going to make a lot of mistakes, but that you also are ready to stand up and say, yeah, I made a mistake. Let's figure out how we can fix this. And you do your best possible job to avoid doing that. Um, and I think the way that this applies practically to our topic today is not checking in things that you haven't tested, 
you have done your best effort to guarantee that the changes you're about to make on your system are not going to leave it inoperable, you're not lazy about it, that you take pride in this work that you're doing. Um, he also talks about do no harm to structure. And the reason I bring this up is not to be complete with my coverage of the introduction to this book, but more because it has bearing on the rest of this presentation. So uh, the quote, if you compromise the structure, you compromise the future. I think this is an important thing if you want to sticky note this and put it up on your screen right next to where you have your password written down. Um, <laughs> I feel like during the course of your job, you probably very often find yourself in a situation where you're confronted with, yeah, I know how to solve this problem and I can just get it done. And then the other way, which is, I think I know how to solve this problem the right way, but it's going to take more work. And his argument is, you should probably take the way that makes more work, takes more work, but re results in the more elegant, more maintainable, more collaborative pro uh, process that other people are going to be able to understand. If you get mugged and can't work because both of your hands are slashed up. Or if you win the lottery. Or if you win the lottery. <laughs> I think one of those things is probably a lot more likely to happen than the other. I don't know. Got to um, work. Somebody else can pick up where you left off. All right. Um, and I like that he brings up the, uh, the Boy Scout rule. In terms of software engineering, he says that you should uh, always check something in cleaner than when you took it out. So he, he does say, like, you know, you're going through this stuff, you're reading code just like you're reading a novel. Um, you should practice that on a regular basis. And if you see something that doesn't fit into the style guidelines of your department or your organization, then you fix it right there. And you make these little commits and you check them in and you just gradually try to improve. Um, Another thing that's interesting in there is that he talks about professional development. And, you know, I just want to put this up there just because these are just some things that I'm reading, um, Elliot's reading. And we don't just sit around and read stuff about Max all the time. Like, we're very, have a lot of different interests and uh, we plan on learning a lot of different things. But Robert Martin's point is that. As a professional, it is not your employer's job to make sure that you're developing. It's your job. Even to the fact where, and, and you know, you can argue with him about this, but he says, you know, if you work 40 hours a week at your day job, then you should expect to spend 20 hours a week of your own time doing professional development. I'm not saying that that is the prescription for being a Robert Martin juggernaut, but um, it's, it's really just meant to suggest that you're Employer does want you to improve, but maybe not enough that they're going to dedicate spending their money on you doing it, especially for a significant portion of the week. So anyway. If uh, I can jump in and say one more thing, too. Sure. My nickname, Home by Six, on Twitter started as like me being proud of the fact that I could clock out at 5.30 and had a short commute and get home by 6 and stop working and stop thinking about work. And that was true when I was doing something that was like, that I liked doing, but I didn't. I wasn't really passionate about. Now I'm really getting into stuff that I'm passionate about. I'm really. I, I want to work. Like that's why. I, that's why I work where I work. And so yeah, I might still be home by six, but I'm still working. I'm still thinking about how I can develop professionally and still learning things because frankly, it's fun. Yeah. So uh, the nickname doesn't apply so much anymore, except for the commute. But it's a little history. I'm here to work. I'm not interested in fun. <laughs> that's a, that's a joke. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about documentation a little bit, and Elliot is going to take charge. All right. So yeah, part of being, being a professional is documenting what you do. Being, first of all, being familiar with what you're doing, and familiar, familiar enough to be able to explain it to somebody else. Um, I forget who said this, but you know, if, if, you, if you don't know something well enough to explain it to somebody else, then you probably don't know it well enough for yourself. So documenting is one aspect of that. If you can write something down well enough to, for somebody else to follow along, then that shows kind of a mastery over wh what you're trying to do. Um, and you are ultimately responsible for documenting the systems that you set up. And that's just, just part of being a professional. It's, you know, sometimes it's really sexy to be uh, uh, an engineer or an IT guy. <laughs> and 
the sexy part of being an engineer or an IT guy or a you know, systems admin or something like that is setting up new things, learning new stuff, uh, adding new features, implementing new systems, uh, making some progress, you know. But uh, writing documentation isn't quite as rewarding, first of all, because it's not really outward facing. You know, not everybody who is uh, supporting your role in the organization gets to see that documentation. So spending time on it doesn't seem like it's something that's going to get you mileage. Um, but the fact is, if you don't have documentation for something uh, and then you, you turn out to need that later, that's going to be, you know, that's, that's going to be negative mileage in a big way. So it, it's just, uh, just part of being a professional for your own good and for whoever replaces you, whenever that may be, uh, to have something documented, obviously. Uh, what is good documentation, though? I would say it is in a single place. At least it starts in a single place. There's got to be a hub, Fort Knox, where your documentation is safely stored. And that's the first stop on the documentation check when somebody wants to learn something about a system that you've set up. Uh, it's probably in the form of a wiki or a repository or an internal website of some sort, uh, you know, Confluence or, or GitLab, MediaWiki, uh, or um, Jekyll too, if you want to, if you want to do that. Uh, but that one place isn't the only place, of course. It's it links to other places that make sense to link to, but there still needs to be a central place to start from. And that central place should ideally be comprehensive about all those other places. And the external wikis, like the monkey wiki or the auto package wiki, should be linked to from that one place. Uh, so it should give you some breadcrumbs to follow. When is the best time to write documentation or to update documentation? Um, I would say that it is when you touch something, when you change, uh, when, you, when you actually go through and, and follow a process, if that process isn't right in your documentation, that's the time to make it to correct that problem. Not later, you know, writing a to-do and, and it, it, it becomes, you know, you, you work through it, you fix that problem and it's no longer relevant, you forget to do it later. Uh, so right now when you're actually doing that process is the time to update that process. I would say too, this was uh, Shay's great idea and I think it's, it, it's uh, something that I'm going to try to adopt. Schedule a recurring meeting on your weekly calendar every single week where you are do not disturb in a, in a conference room somewhere uh, hacking out documentation or going through old documentation and finding what's old and, and stale uh, and updating it and just make that time sacred, you know, separate yourself. If you can, if you can uh, find a room that you can close the door, you know, not everybody has an office that has rooms, but yeah. uh, if you can find somewhere to, to seclude yourself, uh, it makes it a lot easier. I find it to be a lot less onerous of a task or something to avoid doing when you just commit to the fact that I'm stuck doing this every week, so I'm just gonna do it. Like you get into the habit of doing it and then you get it done. And especially if you say I'm gonna do it for one hour, you know, 52 weeks later of one hour a week, that's a lot of, you know, documentation time spent. And to be fair, I think a lot of times our argument is like, well, nobody even ever reads this stuff. And I know the number one person who benefits from this documentation is me. And so it's definitely an investment in my own comprehension. If I have to be able to spend, or I have to spend a lot of time to be able to articulate something into the documentation, then I probably end up understanding it a lot better by the end of the process. Right. And another time it would be, it would make sense to update documentation is when you're training somebody, either to replace you or to temporarily take over your duties while you're on vacation or to help you with something, you know, hire an intern. Um, if you're going over those processes with somebody trying to teach them and the documentation doesn't exist, that's the time right then to, to tackle that. But everybody says, I don't have time right now. <laughs> yeah, nobody has time right now. We're all busy. And busy, you know, what, was, it, was it, I'm going to mess this up, was it Socrates that said, <laughs> beware uh, a busy life? I don't know, something. Anybody? No? All right. It'll be in the notes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're all busy. And that has varying degrees of meaning. Uh, it could be busy work, or it could be like, you know, I have a deadline in an hour and I need to get this done. And uh, I know I alternate between the two, so it's, it, it's different day to day. But this is another form of busy. You know, this is just one more thing that you can be busy with, that you should be busy with on a weekly basis. 
and just fit that into your busy, whatever that means for you. Yeah. I think you absolutely need to be able to just have a pad of paper or something that when a, something pops in your head, hey, I really just came up with an amazing idea for something I need to document, doesn't mean you need to do it right then. Just write it down and get back to doing what you were doing before. And then when that weekly jam comes up, right. it's time to jam. And that rolls right into the next idea, which is a lot of wikis let you create stub pages. So you can, you can write down all these things that you want to document. If you, if you literally don't have time right now, then you can just write down the idea of documenting this thing later by creating a stub page. And then uh, many wikis will let you see an index of all those stub pages that don't have any content. And then you can go through your documentation jam and fill some of those out uh, you know, the, next, the next weekly time that happens. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, another really great application of this is if you are training someone, yeah, you can show them how to do something, and that may apply to a certain kind of learning style, but uh, you can also say, you know what, we're missing documentation on these topics. Why don't you go learn it, and you fill it out, and then I'll sit down and review your documentation about it. And you know, that doesn't mean that you're just kicking them to the curb and say, come knock on my door in eight hours. You, know, you can give them some hints, help them get started, but I think this is a really good way to get these new people up to speed because just like we just said, they can't write anything about it if they don't understand it. Right. Yeah, it's a good way to learn a new system if you're, if you're taking over duties from somebody else or passing them on, um, definitely. And it's, if it's on your calendar, you're less likely to forget it. Ideally, if it's blocked off, if like nobody can schedule a meeting during that time, uh, you're, you're more likely to forget it or you're less likely to forget it. And also you get the benefit of, you know, if you're working and, and you're uh, doing your normal thing, then you get a notification that pops up and says, write some documentation. Cool. <laughs> a little automated nagging is healthy. It's okay. Uh, you, you can handle it. Maybe, maybe the notification center isn't the way to do it. Maybe it's an email. Maybe it's a, a Slack channel or something. Just, you know, bug yourself and then it'll be easier to actually get to happen. Um, next, I would say it's important to schedule regular reviews of documentation with other people, not just secluded in a conference room, but actually go through it with, with others and have a meeting and, and tear it apart. Have somebody review the documentation you've written and see if it's understandable. Review other people's documentation and see if it's understandable. Um, if it's not read and edited and updated on a regular basis, then it withers and die. You know, it dies. It needs watering like plants. Uh, it needs tender, loving care. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, a lot of wikis will let you sort uh, by date modified on all your on all of, of a particular space or all of a particular uh, child page structure. And you can see which ones are the oldest, which ones haven't been touched in a long time. Go give those some attention. Make sure they're still up to date. And of course, get rid of stuff you don't use if it's no longer relevant. Then it's just confusing, you know. Update it or get it out of there. Uh, and it's it's sometimes hard to get busy people to show up at a meeting and help out with that kind of thing. So one solution for that is to add tacos. <laughs> All right, that's all you, buddy. Yeah. Does anybody recognize these guys? Yeah. It took me a while. Yeah. Check out that guy. Um. <laughs> Bill Gates. So uh, that's not Bill Gates, just in case you're wondering. Um, so we want to just talk real briefly about documentation style. And you know, I think probably a lot of us may be scarred from our high school years of being forced to learn the cryptic incantations of MLA or something <laughs> like that. Um, I think what Elliot and I are arguing here is that we're not going to prescribe a style to you. We're not going to say that you have to prescribe a style at your institution um, that's really heavy-handed. Just there's some general guidelines about, once again, being a professional that wouldn't hurt to follow. And, and you can develop these things as much or as little as, as you want. So, you know, writing in complete sentences, that sounds awfully familiar. Um, using templates to ensure the uniformity of structure, really, we're, we're going to make use of the features of our wiki to make sure that every document in that wiki follows that style, has a certain uh, components that we expect to be in each one. 
for my particular organization, all of our templates have a, a section that says, who is this document for? There's this quick synopsis, and then there's like step-by-step -step detailed instructions, and there's references all at the bottom. And we have different templates for different types of processes, but they all generally have that same structure. So we use those so that there is some uniformity of, of structure that you don't read one person's wiki page and it's just totally different from everybody else's. And that, that's something that peer review helps with too. If Absolutely. somebody writes something that's totally, the tone is wrong or the style is wrong, then you can catch that during the peer review sessions. Yeah. And um, what we're going to get to in just a second is just a little teaser is, you know, I think there's lots of exhortations to document stuff. You need to be doing better documentation. All right, go do it. And it doesn't necessarily help with, well, what is it that I'm supposed to be documenting? Like, give me a kick in the butt to some ideas of what I should actually have in my documentation. So we're going to talk about that in just a second. But um, we're... <laughs> Spoiler alert, we're going to say that there's a lot of documentation that actually already exists in the form of the documents that describe your monkey repository in the first place. And so when you're linking to these things from your wiki, you need to probably make sure that there is some kind of explanation for total noobs. What is it that you're even looking at here? Even so much as like, you know, here's what a plist is. Here's what the manifests do. Here's what a package info file does. Um, I think we covered all this stuff, but we want to make sure that we show these sweet sweaters. Um, so, as we mentioned, monkey-specific documentation. What are the kinds of things that we want to see in our documentation systems? Um, so, for me, one of the big things that I am super imp think is super important is that I have documentation of how all of the instances of my Docker containers are deployed. I, I need other people to have that information in case I'm not available to set that stuff up again. Um, and you know that crosses over. You know that's not just the contents of the monkey repository. It's how that monkey repository is hosted itself, um, and and that can certainly have some overlap with, you know, depending on the size of your organization, the LAN team, the security team, WAN team, etc. Um, we, uh, we have a, a manifest structural over, overview. So uh, talking about like what is the, the guiding principles for how we organize our manifests. Is it just a free-for-all in there or do we have some rhyme or reason to how we lay out the manifests, how we have them nested or included in each other. Um, and uh, we'll talk about later about the documenting the actual manifests as well. Um, Likewise, product listing. Here are the things that, as a department, we commit to maintaining, providing, supporting. Um, in a lot of cases, this is what are all the names from your package info files? What are all the products that you have in your repository? Um, obviously, there's some kind of insider things like configuration items and whatnot that a lot of people are not going to be interested in, but that documentation is not really for them. It's, it's for IT. Um, the emergency plan, this maybe is just an overall one, or it could be sections of, you know, the day-to-day -day operations. What happens if? What are your most critical services, and what's the procedure to follow if one of them goes down? And you should probably have a procedure, some kind of checklist to follow. Like, rather than, oh crap, it's down, I'm going to go power cycle the rack and hope that everything comes back, and I'm going to go get some tacos. Let me know when it boots up again. Um, need to have all those things codified. Um, we, uh, I think it's perfectly acceptable to not reduplicate the work that other people have done. So there's a lot of information out on the internet. I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. The monkey wiki being a prime example. You know, for most of this information, you can just say, hey, did you read this? Did you read this? Did you read this? RTFM, um, link right to it. You know, it doesn't have to be all internally produced documentation. And if, you're, if your internal process for setting up your monkey repo, for example, is similar enough to something that's already in the wiki, then link to that, but include the organization-specific kind of, you know, overrides or the, you know, the, the differences that are specific to your, your, uh, your environment. 
Yeah. And then finally, I, I also maintain in, in the same documentation system all of the articles that address issues that rise to the, or show up in the help desk enough times that it's like, you know what, we really need to document how to solve this problem. Not only so that the help desk can point people to those issues, but so that they can train new uh, members of their team quickly as well. Um, so we have this nice diagram, uh, this metaphor of the wheel, but we have all of our main documentation in the wiki, and then we have links to the other things that support that, support our systems. And uh, we th I think of that ops wiki as, in a lot of ways, being an index to these other things. So, um, you know, yeah, we've got links to puppet docs, we've got links to the monkey wiki, but we've also, uh, we're also gonna present the monkey repository information itself, you know. Yeah, monkey is a web server, so you can go and connect to that web server and look at those files yourself, but we're actually gonna link to them so that information is available uh, easily, and, and we treat it as documentation. So, just some examples, uh, package infos are documentation. So, if you feel like really guilty that you haven't been writing any documentation, these package info files are. In a lot of cases, they're automatically generated. So, you know, this is an example of, yeah, we put in some notes because there's some extra steps that have to go into deploying any connect in this organization. Um, and this is probably the ideal place to put it in there so that it's with the product that it's configuring. If you have to go through the whole package info file looking for, well, what is it, how, does it have a, you know, does it have any scripts? Does it have any, um, you know, uh, selection parts where it's trying to pick sub packages out and install those, installer choices, XML? Had to think of that one for a second. Um, and if you use a GUI app like Monkey Admin to manage your Monkey repo, there is a field in there called Admin Notes that, that translates to this. Yeah. So you can paste it in there and it'll show up in the plist. Yeah, and that's, um, we wanted to talk about that briefly is that, you know, you can, uh, you can make up whatever keys you want and they're happy to be in there and just be ignored. But notes as a, as a key in the package info does get stripped from the catalogs. So when, the, when you run make catalogs, compiles all those uh, package info files into the catalogs that the client machines actually download, this gets stripped. Maybe it's not really gonna make a huge difference in terms of data usage back and forth or, or consumption of disk space on the server, but it's, it's a nice touch. And uh, we put this in here just to remind you that if you use XML style comments um, rather than a, a key with a string value, they get stripped out by a lot of different things. So you could lose that information. Um, so it's probably best to just use that notes field. And even in things that don't necessarily support it, like manifests, for example, you can put comments in there too, just as long as they're not XML comments. And speaking of manifests, those are also documentation. So yeah, we've got a document that's, what is the structure of our repository? How do we organize things? But then, yeah, we're gonna talk about like what are the actual things that are in there? How do we have it structured? Um, and uh, we're gonna be talking about Spruce later. This is a, a, a project that really just started as me writing tools to help clean up systems that I manage. And I'm slowly in the process of polishing it and making it useful and, and more flexible for other people to use. And uh, it's available now on my GitHub, but we're definitely just adding a lot of stuff and, and trying to make it awesome. And one of the things that Elliot and I were talking about in preparing for this presentation was, let's add a verb for creating documentation from the information that we have in the monkey repo. And so this is just kind of a, a proof of concept that I did using other code that I had sitting around to spit out, okay, if we wanna document what are the products that we support, let's go through all the package info files and, and grab all the information about them. And, just this morning I changed it so now all the version numbers are actually links to the actual package info file. So if you wanna learn more about an individual one, you click on it and you can see that actual package info file. Uh, and you can see it pulls those notes in there, gives you some other data. So this is gonna change a, a lot, but 
the idea is that it's going to do several different pages and it outputs them to Markdown, or you can have it render it to HTML and you can have that get uploaded. You can automate this so that whenever you check in code to your monkey repository, and we're going to talk about version control a little later, it'll automatically redo all the documentation and update your documentation system as well. Um, so just a couple more examples, and we can kind of speed through these a little faster, but other things that are documentation in your system that is kind of free, you've already done it, is your recipe list. So if you're using Auto Packager, uh, what's the location of that? In your home library allocation support, Auto Packager recipe list? You got it. And uh, if you just run it in the terminal, you probably have a text file somewhere that lists all those recipes. And uh, you know that's important. Just because we're saying, hey, we support all of these items as a department, it doesn't mean that we have them all automated, that we're managing them all with auto package, and that we're testing all those auto package processes. So you'll also notice that every single one of these recipes in the recipe list is an override. And we'll talk about that a little later as well. Um, oh, even right now. Im <laughs> immediately. <laughs> um, so yeah, recipe overrides are definitely a form of documentation as well. And, and you know, in a lot of cases that is, how do we standardize a lot of these values so that they're appropriate for our organization? Not necessarily the organization of whomever wrote the recipe in the first place. And sneak, sneak preview too, At, towards the end we're gonna show you a tool that can automatically generate overrides uh, per your, you know, your, your specific uh, template. company settings. Yeah, yeah, using a template. Uh, for all your uh, recipes that you subscribe to all at once. So I can take a, a recipe list and make overrides for all those recipes all at once. Uh, so that's, that's, that's all 90 you. Percent success <laughs> 90 percent success rate. 90 percent success, yeah. 90 percent of the time it works all the time. Mm -hmm. um, your commits are also an important piece of documentation. Your commit history in your monkey repo, in your auto package uh, recipe rep repositories, uh, anywhere you, you get version control anything, uh, or you know any kind of version control. Your git history is is the canonical uh, source for what has changed and when and by whom. And so if something goes wrong, you need to go back and figure out when this thing was set up. Or if you're just curious about you know how long has this file been hanging around, you know git is the, is the canonical place for that. Um, this is you know we'll I'll talk a little bit about git style and various methods of thinking about that, but you know, if you want to, I'm, I'm sure anybody who uses version control knows, you can add as much text as you want. There's a long description. Um, technically, it's supposed to be the, the short description uh, is the first, the first line, it's supposed to be 50 characters or less, ideally, uh, and then a blank line, and then you can type a, a longer description. And that description can be in whatever format you want. This is almost like Markdown, you know, it's a kind of a, um, a, a hyphen prefixed list. Uh, but you can expand on the git, if you, uh, the, the commit, if you want to share additional information. And most importantly, you can see who's to blame for whatever it is that <laughs> you're looking for what went wrong. Um, the style that, j that the jQuery organization recommends is, as you see there, um, the, the short description is the first line, optional long description. And then if you want to cross-reference issues or other commits, you can do that by using uh, fixes or closes or reference, uh, things like that. Um, and you can see on the right, that's my git history, my one line git log for uh, my auto package recipe repo. And I have my own kind of consistent style that does not match what, what they say to do, but I'm consistent with myself. Uh, I'm okay with that. I may actually be changing it soon, you know, but in two years I'm sure somebody will tell me that I've been doing it wrong and uh, I'm still doing it wrong. So, you know, it, it varies. But as long as you, your organization is consistent about style, uh, I think that's, that's the important thing because then there's no ambiguity about what a commit message means. Um, to elaborate on that, they, they say, the jQuery folks say that it should be an, an imperative. Uh, verb tense should be descriptive yet succinct. No longer than 50 characters. First letter should be capitalized. No period. Um, it's supposed to be like the title of, of the commit message. Uh, but on that same page where they say that, they give an example here of a, of a good, uh, which is actually more than 50 characters. It's 58 characters. 
this. So even among the organization itself, there's some discrepancies about like what, what a good uh, commit style is. So the point is, don't worry about it too much. Pick one you like and stick to it and make sure it works well for you and then, and then be consistent. Yeah, you're just trying to make something that makes it meaningful for a human being to, to look through that information. Um, you know, if it just says fix some stuff, that's basically no better than noise. Yeah. Um, we want to take about, talk about the design of our management systems. And, and I guess primarily this is talking about the design of what I'm doing, but I think it can apply to a lot of people. And it's certainly not uh, meant to be the prescription for everybody. Um, but just give you an idea of the kinds of things that I have to do to deal with a lot of offices all over the world. Um, so we're going to talk about a number of services that we may run to run to support these things. And we're going to go into greater detail about each one of these things as we go. So um, the first thing we're going to talk about is, is what kind of web server we want to run Monkey on. And you know, I think this was a question that when we were developing this, Elliot said, you know, I would really like to know the answer to this question. And so you know, if you Google it, Obviously, there's lots of people arguing about it's the internet, right? So there's lots of people arguing about which one's better. Um, and I think that there is a technical answer, and then I think there's a pragmatic answer. And so the technical answer is that because the monkey repo is static content, Nginx does seem to have a little bit of an advantage there. Um, it, it can handle a lot of requests without freaking out. Whereas maybe uh, Apache has a little bit of a harder time. But really, how much does that really matter? I'm not sure that it, it's super important. I think what's more important is that if you've spent your whole life, uh, <laughs> that sounds dramatic, but if you spent your whole life <laughs> supporting Apache and then some punk new kid Nginx shows up, doesn't mean you need to just jump onto Nginx and, and ride that one for the rest of your life. If you're comfortable doing Apache and you've got other stuff to do, just run Apache. Um, likewise, I think, fortunately, I find that Nginx seems, for me, easier to keep track of how to configure it and not make as many mistakes. So I prefer, and it just seems to not hurt that it has OK performance for static files. Especially if you, if you know Apache well enough to kind of mitigate some of that performance. You know, if, if, you, want, if you put a, a load balancer in front of it and do all the, all the tweaks that Apache administrators do, I assume, uh, yeah, if you know it that well, then you should probably stick with that. Yeah. Um, and we're not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about Docker, but you know, that's the other thing is that in a lot of cases, it, maybe it doesn't matter which web browser or which web browser, which server <laughs> you're running, because in a lot of ways, somebody smarter than you has already done the work of making a Docker container for it, and all you have to do is pass the right environment variables to that container. And it'll configure those few things that are likely that you actually have to change, like host name. And uh, you, know, you don't have to worry about knowing how to configure these things. So um, I don't feel like we need to really cover Docker. I'm sure everybody's familiar with the concept and probably played around with it. If you haven't, you should definitely check it out. Because all of the services um, that we're talking about today in my stack are running on, on Docker or Maybe we're experimenting a little bit with using uh, Kubernetes to, to do that as well. So, um. and, and if you're really interested in Monkey and Docker, uh, <laughs> there's a session going on at 1.30 today. Uh, <laughs> but if you're on YouTube, you can definitely find that video, I'm sure. Yeah, we feel kind of bad because they, I guess they changed the schedule because we were going to say, hey, you should go check out this thing. But it's it was going to be after, yeah. Yeah, it's actually at the same time. So. Wah, wah. Um, but, just so we can talk about document documentation one more time, Docker files are a form of documentation. I mean, code is, in a sense, documentation. So here is an example of uh, a Docker file. And the scripts, if you're still kind of lame like me and you start up a lot of these instances with just a bash script, um, that's documentation too. How do, you, how do you actually run these things? So and, and to be clear, he's burning a Docker container there, not the documentation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just some, some awesome old Hong Kong uh, action film there. So this is you. Um, Better tomorrow. So a common need for uh, companies that are running Monkey is to provide services externally. And uh, it's, it's kind of a, a it, there's, there are kind of three options for doing this. 
One is to provide your monkey server on the inside of your LAN, on the inside of your network, um, and then make everybody VPN in if they want to actually connect and get updates. And ideally, it would be the carrot and stick approach where they're already VPNing in for some other reason, and monkey just kind of piggybacks on that. Obviously, nobody's going to uh, VPN in just because they want the latest Chrome update. Like That's not necessary and probably not desired. Chrome's pretty good about offering that to you. Right, if you've got that set <laughs> that way, yeah. Um, and, you know, alternatively, you could uh, provide services, a, a server on the outside that synchronizes using rsync or uh, some other method uh, to your main server on the inside. And then the, the external clients could check in with their server. If you have multiple servers on the outside, they could check in with the closest one geographically. And we'll go into a little bit about how that could be configured to intelligently go to the nearest server. Uh, but this is another way to do it, just have multiple servers synchronizing with each other, and then the clients can talk to whichever one makes sense for them to talk to. And finally, if you're wanting to put your monkey repo entirely in the cloud, as they say, uh, which is, you know, what are they passing around on Slack, that sticker that said there is no cloud, it's just someone else's computer. I love that, I want yeah. that sticker. Um, they, uh, if you want to put everything in, in Amazon, for example, on S3, you can do something like this, where your internal clients and your external clients are treated the same. They both go to S3, for example, to, to get their updates. Um, and if you do have multiple repos and you want to intelligently have your clients go to the right one, there's a couple ways to do that, too. Um, one of them is just to use straight up DNS. I think this is what they call split horizon DNS, where you have the same uh, uh, domain name, like monkey.example.com, point to two different IP addresses, whether it's internal or external. So the, the external one would point to your external server, the internal one would point to your internal server, and clients would just do a lookup as, as usual. Um, another option is to look for, uh, to set up a launch daemon with uh, watching the system configuration path, and then when that path changes, which means a network change has happened, a script executes that uses the, the current IP address to intelligently figure out uh, where am I? Am I on the LAN? Am I off the LAN? And therefore, which monkey repo should I go to? And it rewrites the software URL in the monkey uh, preferences to, uh, to reflect that. Um, that's another way to do it. Uh, or you could rewrite Etsy hosts, although don't, don't do that. Um, <laughs> and another option is to point clients to different repos from the server side. So uh, the client checks in with the primary server, the, the server based on the IP address of the client request, either provides the software and, and the, the manifest and the catalog that they're asking for, or points to, no, you don't want me, you want this other server because it's closest to you. And uh, you could set up some, some redirect rules in Apache to, or in Nginx to, to make that happen. Okay, yeah, I think we're bringing a lot of stuff up too, just to say, you know, here's some ideas, here's some things to think about this. We're not gonna show you, like, <coughs> How do you configure load balancing? Here's every single, single thing you need to think about in terms of certificates and everything else. But just here's some ideas about what is out there and what you can pretty easily learn about. And I think a lot of this stuff we're going to flesh out more fully through some uh, writing on our blogs over the next year, um, really kind of doing case studies of, of how we actually implement this stuff. So. Um, that's coming, but one of the things that uh, we can do is potentially, instead of just having a single repository, depending on your needs, you might need several servers that can load balance, and it turns out that uh, our friend Nginx makes this super easy, so um, this is very simplified, but it says we've got these three monkey servers, and uh, we're gonna act as a load balancer in front of it, and there's lots of different ways you can configure this. Um, the kind of default way is, all right, I'm connecting the monkey server. You go to monkey server number one. Next client, monkey server number two. Number three, back to one. So it just round robins its way around there. And you can get super fancy and, uh, you know, depending on your organization, you probably have people who have a lot of experience doing this who can help out um, in your actual product. You know, they do that on a daily basis. Um, likewise, you can do the same thing uh, using either Apache or Nginx as a separate server to restrict access in and, and work as a proxy. So one of the things that um, uh, 
Graham Gilbert was nice enough to send us uh, the one he uses, and we've, we've kind of trimmed it up, but you know, how do I allow my computers to check into our management system while they're off the corporate network, but then not allow people to do any of the other stuff on the management system? So they can't log into the Sal GUI, they can't modify anything unless they're actually VPN'd in or on the corporate LAN. Um, and so, again, we kind of cleaned this up, but really it, it's super simple. You just have a series of uh, regular expressions that it goes down the list from top to bottom and it says, you know, which paths are allowed to go in and which paths are just going to be bounced. And so we're going to let check in, inventory submit, and uh, <laughs> invent. I guess that got trimmed down. Um, we're going to let all those in. And everything else, forget about it. You got to be on the network. And this is a bad example too, because we, just to make it simple, yeah, you'll notice that this is just straight HTTP. So we so wouldn't do that in real life. Unless you're playing with man and middle attacks. Yeah. <laughs> we learned in the workshop. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we want to go over just a, a real quick, there's, um, there's some great information on the monkey wiki about how do I start adding layers of security to these services. So um, option number one is, is what we call YOLO mode. Just run HTTP and nothing to worry about. It's only available internally, so nothing bad can happen, right? Um, if you had the pleasure of attending uh, the workshop the first day, you learned how simple it is to mess around with this. So. Um, we actually built a, a bad monkey server, did a man in the middle attack, and fed stuff, got a privilege escalation, and had an admin account on that machine in this workshop. Um, and that was over the course of like from lunch to the end of the session, most of us having no experience doing that kind of thing at all. So um, probably not the best thing to do. And that was the excellent Johan Genie right there who had scared yeah. us to death in that workshop. <laughs> yeah. If, you, if you're a school and you have like teenagers at that school, don't do that. Yeah, um, they're, they're smarter than you think. Yeah. So <laughs> it's really simple to provide basic authentication um, as just a, as a like meager sort of uh, protection um, using a username and password to authenticate. And um, I think the important thing is here that we're saying you really have to use SSL. And one of the things that's cool, if you follow this link at the bottom, yet another Graham Gilbert link, he um, doesn't specifically address this, but um, the, the information is all there. How you can run a Docker container of uh, Nginx instance that will take your non-SSL monkey server and turn it into SSL, like magic. Um, so if you have an existing instance, it's super easy to just turn that on and uh, away you go. And finally, option three, client certificates. And um, I've got the links there to the Monkey Wiki and to the excellent series on how to implement this. This certainly was how I figured out how to do this myself. Um, so those are worth reading in detail. But the way it works is that each client computer has its own private key and public certificate combination. And they have, you have some kind of certificate authority within your organization that they get their certificate signed by. The monkey server will only allow connections from machines that have a properly signed certificate. Um, this is a probably much better way to secure all your stuff. Um, and the way I do it is with Puppet, because I can spin up a Puppet server container really quickly, and it doesn't do anything except operate as a CA for me. I just don't want to mess around with, uh, with setting that up, and it's, it's super simple. But again, depending on the size of your organization and what the security team's requirements are and everything else, where are we at? Oh, I'm getting all crazy here. Um, you know, they might already have a certificate authority set up, and then you don't have to worry about it even more. Um, the next thing we wanted to talk about is version control options. So again, this is information that's on the wiki, and there's I'm sure lots of blog posts about it as well that can help you figure this out. But the gist of it is that your monkey repository is your running system. The way it is set up is what dictates the behavior of your clients. And so you need to be able to know exactly what has changed and be able to audit that. Not 
even, I mean, it's super important if you have more than one person who has their hands on the repository, but I, I would argue that it's just as important. I certainly go back in time and look at stuff. I'm like, what idiot did this? And it's, it's me, you know, or I've just completely forgotten. Why is this even here? You know, I have a real short uh, memory for that sort of thing. And so or it really helps. In my case, I'm trying to do the same thing I did six months ago at a new client. And so referring to that old uh, commit history is super useful because I can just copy what I did then and do it again. Yeah, and so um, just real quick, you know, the, this setup works because you're, you're uh, committing everything in the repository uh, except for catalogs, um, the actual package payloads to the, the version control. And then you can set up a means by which when you push changes to the server, when you merge, uh, the, you know, you can get super elaborate with it or you can have it be pretty simple, but you can use one of these hooks, like when a push is received from that server, then it's going to SSH out to or do some other means for contacting the actual monkey repositories, the actual web servers, and tell them to pull the changes. Um, oh, good. <laughs> so on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, somebody who's involved in managing monkey is going to have to uh, follow the general workflow. So it's not that different from any other software project. They're gonna get pull, make sure they have the newest version of everything, they're gonna make those changes, they're gonna commit the changes, and they can push them back to the Git server. And hopefully, you know, it's, somebody's gonna review it before it goes live. Um, so there's a couple other things that I'm just gonna throw up here and, and you can look up. Again, we're just trying to suggest ideas, but how do you deal with those packages? You know, all those big Adobe packages, Office packages, um, stuff like that. Uh, for a long time, uh, Git fat was a solution, um, and it's still a solution. Still works, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think GitHub has also uh, created Git LFS, large file storage, um, that makes it really simple so that you can work on this repository and you don't necessarily have to have all the packages as well. So you can use the same Git commands to manage separately the large files, what's tracked in that system versus the code. And it does a lot better job of handling those big binary packages uh, that it kind of thrashes around if you try and do uh, with just straight Git. So managing those changes. So um, there's different approaches, and we're going to kind of go from, from maybe the weakest to the best in terms of making changes on your monkey repository. And so maybe we should have just called it YOLO mode but um, as well, but just hot mode, like you're going to sign on to the server and make your edits right there and they're just active as soon as you make catalogs um, or immediately you edit a manifest file and it's immediately available. Um, you know, there, I think everyone can see that there's a lot of downsides to that. You, I think uh, that that's what the web developers call cowboy coding. Yeah. Um, so I'll just skip to the end and just say that, you know, at the other end of the scale, you can create a, as many branches as you need, topical branches for, hey, what am I working on right now? I'm, when I make those changes, I'm going to push them up to the server, and somebody has to review them and merge them in. And uh, that way, at least two sets of eyes are on it. Um, and there's a lot of ways to accomplish then taking those changes and getting them onto all your monkey server, uh, actual servers. We have this little diagram to show that, you know, you're working on it on your laptop, the server, there's a number of different means, and uh, you can refer to the slide of actually implementing that sync. Am I still talking? Would you like to talk about this, Elliot? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Give you a break. Um, so you can, package infos are documentation, as we mentioned. And you can organize that documentation, those PLS files, as you, as you need, as, as required for your organization. So just kind of assume that people are actually going to be in that folder browsing through those files and think about what, what subfolder structure, or if, if, if any, makes sense for them to, to easily find what they're looking for. If you have a relatively small and flat monkey repo, then maybe just flat file structure is fine. Um, you know, you can also organize it by category. If you have categories in, in Managed Software Center, uh, you could kind of align those with the file structure. Uh, or you could go all the way and, and organize by developer. Um, obviously, you'd want to use auto package 
uh, recipe overrides to do this kind of automatically. You wouldn't want to have to drag these each time you do a monkey import or, or something like that. But um, yeah, just whatever whatever makes sense for you. And, and you can also reorganize on the fly, you know, with some with some find and replace magic. You can change the structure. It's not too late. You can uh, if you decide that a different structure is right for you. Um, just make sure that your main you know one true source of documentation reflects accurately the place that you should be looking to find these package infos and the structure that they're stored in so that you know where you're going to look for things. You want to talk about the tools that are available to help move? Yeah, I think what we need to do is start moving. There's some stuff I you know, want to make sure we get to. So if we, right, yeah. if we kind of burn through some of this information, I think you know, that's OK. Um, but we just talk about you know, I, there's this ideal representation of like the perfect manifest structure that you've imagined, and it's a great ideal to try and work towards. So, like a lot of things in uh, software, it's it would be great to have no meaningless duplication. I guess would be the caveat is the meaningless part. So, hopefully, you're not, for example, installing Firefox in two different manifests that any one client machine has. Of course, it's not necessarily going to be the end of the world. It's still going to work but it's also going to be hard to get rid of those things and figure out why they're not getting applied or uh, removed uh, when, you, when you do change them. Um, I want to skip right ahead to talking about this idea of client manifests. So um, I think this is where it gets a little more advanced. This is stuff that's not included in Monkey. So um, the idea is that you have one manifest per client machine. And this allows you to do some of those special flower configurations that, yeah, this one person needs this one special thing. Um, the problem with this is it requires one manifest for every machine. And uh, uh, it sure would be nice if there was some way to create these automatically. I wonder if there is a way to do that. I wonder. So, um, but for example, you know, your client manifest, you want to try and eliminate a lot of duplication on this. So in a lot of ways, it's going to be primarily made up of a structure of included manifests. So the way I organize mine, and I think this is somewhat common, is that my client manifests have included site default. And to my mind, you know, you can use it in different ways. But I understand site default in my organization to mean every managed computer in my organization gets these things. Um, likewise, site, every computer that resides at this site gets these things. And finally, every computer that's in this department or group or whatever uh, gets these things. And then the client manifest can contain those things specific to that managed installs, managed uninstalls, optionals for that one machine. Um, so we put these diagrams up here to kind of show you can, you can put uh, a lot of optional software in as well. You know, you don't have to necessarily install every single product that you provide onto every machine. Certainly not. And uh, you can just make a lot of these things optionals and, and this idea of self-service IT where people can go and get the things that they want. And uh, a lot of the things that we have auto package recipes for, there's no reason why we can't make those available as optional things, you know, as long as there's no issues with your legal department or licensing or anything else. So um, we just showed a couple different ways. Yeah, you can create these optional manifests and include them in the site default. So yeah, every single person in my uh, organization can get all the optionals from the fonts because we have the licensing to handle it, no problem. Um, you can also add to that structure of included manifests. We've got an optionals one that then includes all the optionals manifests, which each include all the other ones. It doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent and you have some idea of what you're doing. So client manifest service. This is where it gets interesting. So um, you have a service, and uh, you uh, meaning this is a server somewhere, and your client computers check in, they send it some information about themselves to prove who they are. The client manifest service says, OK, I'm going to build a manifest for you if there's not one already. And I'm going to set it up based on the information you provide me. So you might be able to get this information from your directory services, or you might have some other service that has that information in a kind of inventory. But what it does is it automates the process of making those client manifests for you. And this code exists. Um, there's an excellent series by Graham Gilbert about how he wrote this very thing. Um, I'm releasing information about mine at some point in the near future, which is uh, slightly different. Um, you know, each organization has a different inventory system that it has to deal with and um, directory services and things. But um, we can also use the same service if we create extra endpoints on that API to let 
either IT workers with the right authentication or individuals themselves say, hey, I like computers, I like updates, move me into an earlier testing cycle. So um, instead of being in the production catalog, I want to move up to production or to phase three, which is what we call our final testing cycle. So am I messing up the animations here? No, you're good. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think we can move along here. Uh, likewise, uh, in your reporting tools, SAL, Monkey Report, PHP, you probably want to be able to report on these machines in the same way. And so it's not 100% correct, but there is a certain idea of mapping site potentially to business unit and build to machine group in those tools. You know, they don't necessarily mean the same thing. And there's some limitations about the way those are implemented, but it's one way to think about it. Um, so an example being, oh yeah, our site is the London office and the accounting machines. Um, we can go ahead and skip through that. Um, I think it's important to think about the process of getting computers into management. And so specifically, just pointing out that they don't have to be imaged every time. You can take a machine right out of the box and run it through your enrollment procedure. You can take a machine that somebody's been using for the last couple years but it's been in cowboy mode and you enroll it, or yeah, you can image it or do a recovery partition in store. But the enrollment process of getting your computer managed should be something that you can run over and over again and it su succeeds but each say, time. I thought imaging was dead. Yeah. Uh, so I've heard, I don't know. You can check that bingo box now. Pe people really like it. Um, <laughs> so again, uh, I, I want to kind of just burn through this without getting too far into details and we'll cover this more, but what, what exactly do we mean by enrollment? So um, for the purposes of my organization, what enrollment means is that um, once the computer is, is running and we have the ability to do what we need to on it, it's going to install the dependencies that it needs. So in my case, that's Monkey, the uh, Monkey Configuration Profile Puppet, and this first boot script. And it's going to run the first boot script. The first boot script does a lot of work for me. But I try not to do any work that I couldn't just do later in Monkey, which is my configuration management tool. Um, so it's going to get all the information from our inventory system that it needs, uh, including like who it's being built for and what their home office is and all that stuff. Um, and it's going to set the time zone and make sure that it can bind to the directory. Uh, I set the power configuration so that the machine doesn't go to sleep while it's in the process of bootstrapping. And, and we might want to check in on it and see remotely what it's doing. Um, and many other things. Yeah, and many other <laughs> things. Um, and then it goes through the, the process of getting the client certificates, requesting that the manifest is built, and then it restarts and does the monkey bootstrap process where it's going to lay down all the other software. So uh, we'll put this up here for just a second, but the goal of that thing, like I said before, is that you can run this thing over and over again. And it's going to result in a machine that can connect to Monkey with the client certificate safely. It's got a manifest built for it. And every possible way that it could blow up, you thought about and tried to handle in that script. OK. So maintaining this uh, operationally over the long term is, it, it, it involves kind of a, a high level process of getting things from the internet, uh, either using auto package or whatever method you, you prefer, which should be auto package. Uh, <laughs> probably uh, through a recipe override, uh, customizing that recipe th for your organization, uh, putting things into the testing catalog, which in your case includes just your computer, right? Mm -hmm. And then you test it, make sure it launches. Um, then in, in your organization, you've got uh, three phases that happen over the course of one week each, over the course of a month. Uh, so three months or th three uh, three weeks of that month, software is being tested, uh, and it starts with phase one, which is a small group of just IT people. Phase two is all IT, and phase three is some external to IT people who are uh, good kind of canaries in the coal mine for when software doesn't work. Uh, and then eventually, after the three week test period is done, if there is no major issues, then it goes into production and goes out to everybody else silently, and everybody's happy. Um, Alternatively, if you don't want to do the phased testing, you can do kind of shard testing. Uh, this, I find, is more useful if you want to test, is that thing jumping? Yeah, isn't that crazy? <laughs> I find this is more useful if you want to test the server load that's going to happen when something is deployed. Uh, if, you're, if you're putting out a new version of OS X, for example, from Yosemite to LCAP, 
Uh, you want to make sure that your servers and your caching servers can all handle that. So you want to distribute the load a little bit more randomly. So shards are good for that. Um, and the way that you develop this policy, whether you want to go with phased or shard uh, approach, is to ask yourself a, a questionnaire. And we're just going to breeze through this questionnaire and give some examples. Yours is first, right? Yeah, let me talk through mine real quick. So, um, you know, this isn't all the questions that you have to ask yourself. You, you can generate your own questionnaire, but uh, the one that I, I wrote for this is, uh, you know, how long is the testing cycle? That's pretty simple. Um, for SAS, we do a one month testing cycle and each phase lasts one week. And this is something I inherited from the Windows team. So it's not like this is what I, you know, I wanted to do it that way. We start our testing process on patch Tuesday. That has no bearing on, on Apple testing other than it seems like Apple likes to give me the finger and release stuff like the day after or two days after patch Tuesday and then it's like how do we shovel that into the testing process. So you know, maybe we do roll that stuff in a little bit early anyway. Um, how are testers selected? We, we uh, nominate people in IT primarily and we have some subject experts in other departments who, um, who are asked to do it and, and it's a requirement. You know, we, we really want them to participate. We have expectations of them. Uh, and then we also allow people to opt in via the uh, client manifest service. Um, how we release these things is for testers, during that tested per testing period, we turn unattended install to false for all things. And that way they know that it's coming, they can install it when they want, but we force it at the end of that phase. So we know that it's definitely there. We can say that it at least installed on any, all these people's computers. Because the reality is there's a lot of stuff that comes out on a regular basis that nobody actually is going to use. Um, and then for our production releases, we kind of flip-flop that, where um, except for things that need a reboot, we make that unattended true, and we turn off the force install, you know, unless it's some kind of hot fix that we need to get out there. Uh, we don't want to bother people with it. And Monkey is smart enough to handle, you know, I'm not going to try and install Firefox while Firefox is running. Um, so we handle all the notifications with our documentation system, and we have a system in place through the rest of the questionnaire. How do we, how do we get feedback about this? So my process for at least one client was a little bit different. Um, we ins instead of doing a, a weekly or a monthly testing cycle, we did a per app testing cycle. So in any given week, you know, a, a, an app version would come out. We would test it for one week uh, internally in IT and test it for one week externally to IT. And then usually by then we could decide if it's good or not. And then so we had a, a, you know, various apps in various stages of testing at any given time. And if there were two updates to the same app in the same week, we just tested the first one, unless the second one was super critical, and then we bumped it up in the list. Um, and we also, I guess another important uh, distinction is that we collect, uh, collect the feedback by Google Form. That's, we found that that was a nice way to get all the feedback into a single spreadsheet and review that centrally. Okay. Oh, you're going to hit it. Okay. So just a brief example. Um, I have a checklist. I follow this process each month for this. Uh, I'm in the process of automating as much of this as possible. So. You know, these aren't necessarily all steps that I have to do each time, and we don't need to go over each one, but um, I have a checklist, and I go through it. It's sequential. That way, I don't make any mistakes. Um, fortunately, I, uh, for myself, have written this tool, and, and again, you know, these things are a little rough for general usage, but I use this tool to build my uh, monthly testing workflow. So I can run this phase tool, and, and it's going to go through, and it understands which catalogs do I consider to be testing, and it gathers up. Here are all the things that are in the repository right now, and it makes these two files for them. One of them, you'll notice, is documentation, and the other one is just a list of the paths to the actual files. Once I have that information, uh, there's another verb that allows me to push things through, and this is you know, one of these things that's in the process of being automated. So I can say, prepare, it's set up to do all the toggling of unattended install, force install after date, it sets all that stuff for me. Uh, what you're seeing at the bottom here is the git diffs, uh, just showing, yeah, it's going to set the install, forced install dates for me automatically. I can throw all this stuff into my documentation system and say, here is what the June 2016 testing cycle looked like. Here are all the actual changes being made. Um, we're going to jump real quick into cruft management, because this is the other fun thing that maybe is new information and isn't. Um, you know, already out there. So uh, I wrote this thing called Spruce for when I was a Casper administrator. It helped clean up a lot of stuff in the, the JSS. And I started writing a lot of scripts to do similar things when I went to SAS uh, and start cleaning up the monkey repository. And 
Um, again, it's, it's a little rough at this time, but I keep working on it, and this is my pet project at the moment. Um, so uh, thank you for that, by the way. Spruce has been uh, hugely mm. useful for me. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> um, so uh, just to go over a few of the things that it can do, um, Spruce Report is there's a bunch of reports that I've come up with. Here's some things that you might help you audit your repository and look for problems. So um, you know, if you're running uh, a monkey repository on a Linux server that does such a horrible thing as using case sensitivity, um, <laughs> you might be worried about package infos that refer to a package that has a path that gets munged due to case sensitivity and it's no longer actually working. Um, fortunately, there's none of those in this example. But um, I think the big one is this out-of-date items in production, and we're working on improving this, and I've been talking to lots of people, and I know the man himself, Greg Nagel, has a solution to how to handle all the dependencies and, and make this really bomb-proof. Um, finding things that are not actually being used in the repository, okay? And so we have this other verb called spruce deprecate, and it allows you to take, okay, here's all my products and we're just going to take an example of Flash Player because there's a ton of those. Here's the current production version and we're going to put the ones that we don't want just cut and pasting from the output of Spruce showing here's all the stuff that's out of date. We're going to put it into a removals plist and we're going to feed it into deprecate and it's going to go ahead and get rid of it. Now what this means is it's going to get rid of the package info files, it's going to get rid of the packages that they refer to. And if those are the last ones, which they're not in this case, but if you're just totally getting rid of something, it's going to go through all the manifests and clean out from uh, managed installs and all those other sections. Just get rid of them. You can also archive it, okay? And in this case, it just moves things to kind of an emergency backup place in case you're like, oh, no, I want that back. Uh, a little safer. Um, real quick, we also have the ability to say, you know what, I want my managed software center to look clean and be an easy resource for my employees to find things. So I don't want to have 45 different categories because all these different auto package recipe writers have different ideas of how these things should be organized. So you can report on the categories in your uh, repository and you can recategorize things and it's really fast. It's not like you need to assign individual package info files, it's, it's by product. Um, this is cool but I don't think we have time to talk about Clint here. Um, yeah, that, that, this, is, this is just an example of what we're talking about, that um, I pulled all the auto package organizational monkey, or auto package repos, recipe repos, last week, and just used the Spruce code to build a report of what are all the catalogs that are in use in the monkey recipes, and a not insignificant number of those are not testing, all right? I want new packages to come into my organization and be testing. I don't want them to be development. I don't want them to be production for certain and, you know, any other variation. They have to be testing. Um, so one more, you know, little project. And again, this isn't me trying to push you off onto my, like, broken um, one-off scripts that have proven useful for me. <laughs> um, you know, this is something that you can do as well if you're looking for a project. This is a problem to solve. And so I wrote this thing that says, I'm going to take my recipe list, I'm going to build an override for each one of these things, and I'm going to apply a template to them so that it enforces all the things I care about. Make sure that the catalogs are testing, make sure that the name is the name that I want to use. You know, imagine that you're an international company and, and maybe you need to localize some stuff or whatever. Um, category, developer, all that information I can standardize and make sure that it appears professional. It doesn't look sloppy uh, to the people I'm trying to support. You want to wrap it up? Yeah, sure. So we talked about <laughs> um, a little bit on professionalism and, and how your, your job in IT or as a Mac admin in, requires you to do documentation and intelligent design of your, of your monkey repo and your auto package recipes. Um, and then the, the operational workflow that you know, involves Git versioning and, and uh, you know, collaboration and documentation jams that just happen on a regular basis. And now we have 21 seconds to answer questions. <laughs> so that, that being said, we actually, you know, we're going to end the session. We're here. Yeah, so we'll we're around. happy to, to eat dinner yeah. with you guys and, and 
drink beer and talk about all this stuff. So Absolutely. we'll have Q&A then. Thank you. <laughs>